It's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about DNA, but not the kind of DNA that you're used to, the kind that makes you look like, kind of like your parents. This is an, an unusual use for DNA, which is DNA as a detector. Um, and all of you sh here should appreciate detectors, and I'm going to put it in exactly that context. We have, uh, we're going from outer space detecting dark matter to inner space seeing about our health and our uh, brains using DNA at every step, and most importantly, using citizen science, how you can all participate um, in this project where really you are already the greatest expert on this one subject, which is your own body and mind. So this is my co conflict of interest slide. <laughs> this is uh, Barbara McClintock, who was a pioneer in this idea that, that DNA could be a detector for X-rays, cosmic rays, and, and eventually we realized that these were damaging uh, to our cells and have caused cancer. Uh, she could detect these, these with the colors of the kernels, even little dots on each kernel. Here's something where we're trying to detect a new exotic, hypothetical, partially detected, maybe, uh, particle uh, explaining the dark matter, possibly. Um, these weakly interacting massive particles, there are a number of detectors already in play. Um, um, my colleagues Andre Zukier and, uh, and Katie, Katie Fries and so forth have suggested that we could make this out of DNA where the detector would um, have exceptional angular sensitivity as, it, as the Earth, this laboratory frame moves around the sun and as it changes during the day, the angle becomes quite important, and so we hope that this detector will allow us to detect it with close to atomic precision, very, very uh, uh, high spatial angular resolution. Now, part of the reason that we can even anticipate these kind of things where you measure the XYZ coordinates of something with DNA is because we've had this exponential improvement in, in DNA uh, analysis and synthesis. And for years, it was following a, an exceptionally fast exponential, which is uh, Moore's Law, which affects electronics and computing and so forth. But then it got even more exceptional. Instead of the six decades that we thought that it would take on a Moore's Law curve to get from the $3 billion genome to one that you can all afford, we're now around $2,000 and it's still plunging. Uh, so it took six years and rather than six decades. This has led to genome standards. So you have this genomeinabottle.org. You can look it up if you want to see what a genome standard is from NIST and FDA. But we now use these standards to compare your genome to the standard. And the six billion base pairs, the three billion you got from your mother and your father, um, explodes into a large amount of data, trillions of uh, bytes. But then it shrinks back down once you can compare it to the standard. And, you, and you, uh, if you get a very high-quality sequence, as little as 4 million bytes, 4 megabytes is enough to represent your genome relative to the standard. But then it blows up again because there's 7 billion of us. And in fact, we might not just want our once-in-a-lifetime genome. Our genome changes from day to day. Our, our immune system responds uh, to the environment, and that changes from day to day. So we're talking petabytes there. Um, for the genome. But there's more uh, when we get to brains in just a moment. You can, the accuracy can be, right now it's around 1 in 10 million is sort of the accuracy you can get for, for your genome. That's not too bad, but you do have 6 billion bases. And you can uh, determine uh, this in great detail for clinical settings. But the important thing is not just the raw accuracy, it's how well we can interpret the data. And that requires participation from people like you, everyone out there. If you keep all the information, if everybody on the planet kept all that information to themselves, A, they wouldn't get great medical care, but they also wouldn't uh, help uh, future generations um, to get uh, this connection between our genomes, our environments, and our traits. And the, the data that we collect is not only a million times cheaper now for your inherited genome, but for measuring the environment. Remember I said DNA is a detector. It not only could potentially detect WIMPs, it can detect your environment. Your body responds to toxins, to allergens, to microorganisms, and viruses, and we can detect that now a million times less expensively. And this is already here. This is not something that's a decade away. There already are people that are benefiting what I like to call an N equal one study. Not a study on 
our cohort uh, is approved for 100,000, but each one is an N equal one. Each one is so different from other people that lumping isn't appropriate. And each of these cases, I won't go through them all, are cases where one person got one genome sequence and it changed their life. They might uh, get a cord blood sample that, that uh, changed them from near death, three-year-old, to now uh, very healthy a few weeks later and now eight-year-old. Uh, or they might take uh, dopamine and serotonin precursors uh, because of misdiagnosis of a brain illness um, that got fixed by genome sequencing, and so on. Some of them take aspirin. Some of them get pro prophylactic uh, uh, removal of, of tissue uh, in order to avoid cancer. If you want more information about this or join uh, in the citizen science part of this, either as a, as a research participant or as looking at the data or both, it's uh, personalgenomes.org, and there's education that goes with it at pged.org. So you can, uh, you can map yourself uh, in various ways here. Speaking of mapping, many of the, the, the participants in this, in this, this is the only open access uh, combination of genomes, environments, and traits. It's the only real ac open access project that allows us to look at ourselves as individuals and share that data worldwide. One of the things that they do is we get our... Um, our, our brains mapped, and I should say we, this is my brain, slices through it for fMRI, but many of the other participants get the same thing. Fortunately, these are virtual slices rather than actual slices, uh, or else this would be a much less interesting talk. Uh, <laughs> and this was, a, this was the beginning of, uh, our, of our thinking about improving the technology. To some extent, you can see what you're thinking here in broad strokes. You see different parts of the brain light up if you're thinking about uh, you know, resting state versus uh, hard math problems and so forth. But it's very coarse resolution. We need finer resolution. Now, this has been done by slicing brain, actual slices now, not virtual slices, on, on mice and, and, and humans. But the data uh, uh, are hard to integrate because in order to get this information, you have to do it from thousands of different brains and then try to integrate them, and no two brains are alike. We'd like to do it on one brain, and we'd like to do it a number of different assays. So we have on the order of 300 billion brain cells in each of our brains. Um, and that, that leads us to four different kinds of things we'd like to measure in this brain project that President Obama um, mentioned uh, recently for the United States. It's a measurement project, and all of you at CERN can appreciate how important measurements are. We want to measure the RNAs in the brains. This is how each cell is different from one another, and each human has a different brain than each other how the, the cell lineage is, how they got to where they were, how they, uh, their ancestry, in a certain sense, within your, within your nervous system. The number of connect, the connections each one has, not just the number, but which cell is connected to which cell. There can be thousands of connections per brain cell. This is an amazing computer. And then the events that occur. We don't want to just know the structure of the brain. We want to know the messages that are passing through each of the cells. And so we're talking about things in the order of, of, of petabytes to... Uh, 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 10 to the 15th. Uh, uh, this is plans, I, I have to emphasize. This is not the, the, the kind of data that we're collecting right this second. We have uh, many of us uh, are walking around, about 0.1% of us, maybe hundreds of thousands, have some kinds of electrodes in their nervous system, whether retinal implants, cochlear, or uh, deep brain stimulation is shown here. For Parkinson's, for uh, depression, for epilepsy, and so forth. This is an epileptic patient showing that you can, now this is at higher resolution than the fMRI showed before, where you can literally see the thoughts in a certain sense. The top line are a bunch of faces where this person was recognizing the faces of famous actress Jennifer Aniston, and then the bottom line is a bunch of controls of faces of, of other actresses. Now, this is very frustrating in a certain sense, both because epilepsy is not cured, but also the, 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 the rods that they're sticking in, the wires, the electrodes, are millimeter scale. So you can't stick very many in. And the only reason they got this result at all is they went through hundreds of thousands of pictures. So to really decode all of the thoughts, you need a lot more electrodes. And we'll come back to that in a second. Here's another example of where we'd like to go with this brain project. It's not just about observing and simulating. It's about feeding back into clinical settings. I said many of us have electrodes already. It's... Uh, this is a tetraplegic woman who, who years ago, many years, not had control of her arms or legs, 
So for the first time, John Donahue and his colleagues uh, connected electrodes in our brains to a, a robotic arm, and he and we would like to see this now applicable to uh, her real arms and, and many others uh, like her, any kinds of brain injuries and, uh, and some of the diseases I mentioned before. So we want to have more electrodes, higher quality, lower medical impact, uh, I mean, un unwanted medical impact. So this, this brain project uh, in the United States is about innovative neurotechnology. It's not just about mapping. It's about making things that are aimed at clinical. The, the progress in making the number of electrodes has been very slow, but we hope it will improve greatly by making them much smaller rather than millimeter scale. We can have them so that there are tens of microns in scale. Um, and they can, instead of, uh, in addition to electrodes, you can make optical fibers that go in there and deliver light um, you, and record light. You can use both of them. And so these are much smaller, but we need them smaller still. We, we need them sort of on the cellular or even subcellular scale. Um, especially for some of the animal studies that we will do uh, in preparation. So here's an example of uh huge incremental changes. So 
folding this back, DNA is a detector. I showed you DNA as a detector for um, exotic particles in the universe. Uh, DNA is a detector for uh, crowd uh, involvement, uh, part participatory uh, research, and, and you can learn about your own microbiome. We typically take uh, microbiomic samples from five different parts of, of your, your body over time. And then your immune response to, to all sorts of things, allergens, autoimmune, and so forth. And then finally, as we look inward at, at, at our brain, uh, DNA may be part uh, of these new technologies that will allow us to, uh, to deal with um, our diversity in, in terms of neuroscience. Thank you.